Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ER nurse. Neurological complaints are no stranger to the ER. So as an ER nurse, you must be comfortable performing a neuro assessment. Today, we talk about how to perform a neuro assessment as an ER nurse, what questions you should be asking, and we briefly discuss what emergencies you must master. Let's start off with conditions that you must take the time to familiarize yourself with as they are the true neuro emergencies you're going to see in the ER. At the top, we have brain bleeds and I made a video on them. So I'll tag it here. Besides bleeds, we also should focus on ischemic strokes, seizures, especially status epilepticus, meningitis, encephalitis. Then we also have neurogenic shock, spinal cord injury, and shock. Of course, there's also many other conditions like Bell's palsy, multiple sclerosis, and the list goes on. But first, focus on the ones that we just talked about since they are the true uh, emergencies that you'll see in the ER. Knowing how to perform a quick an accurate neuro assessment is also very important because as you know, time is brain and you do not want to be the nurse who missed a code stroke while triaging a patient because you did not know what you were looking for or what you were doing. You won't do a thorough neuro assessment on every single patient that comes into the ER because there's simply no time for that. But as you as you know, the ER is very focused. And if your patient comes in with a neurological co complaint, like a headache, any motor issues, sensory issues, or for example, just for being altered, this does warrant a more a thorough and detailed neuro exam. So you're going to have to pick and choose who you do a detailed exam on and who you do a simple mini neuro assessment on based on your findings as you're assessing them. First, you're going to start off with your visual assessment. Ideally, once you've gathered some experience under your belt, this is only going to take a few seconds. Essentially, you perform your visual assessment when first coming into contact with your patient, whether it is the patient being on an EMS stretcher, in triage, or in an ER room. You're quickly assessing visually whether your patient is awake and alert. Do they look at you as soon as you come into the room? And are they perhaps purposefully using their extremities are they on their phone using both hands or are they neglecting one side for example they're moving the right upper extremity to assist themselves but never making an effort to move the left upper extremity and you're also going to be looking for an obvious facial droop while you're doing your visual assessment of course as part of your visual assessment you should also be looking at other things like work of breathing and skin color but here we are just focusing on discussing the neural part of the physical assessment of the visual assessment now why is getting a really really good baseline assessment important for your neural patients because well because you as the nurse must be able to train your patient's assessment as we know the first thing to change in a neural patient will be their mentation and level of consciousness this will happen way before you notice any vital sign changes or pupil changes so by getting a thorough baseline neuro assessment, you can compare down the line when something changes. For example, let's say your patient is requiring little by little more stimulation to answer your questions, or perhaps you start feeling like something is off. Well, you have a really good baseline, baseline assessment to compare your findings to. Now, let's get into the important questions you should be asking when performing your neuro assessment. Let's start off with orientation questions. What is their name? Where are they currently at? What day, month, or year is it? And the situation, why are they in the, in the ER? What happened to them for them to happen, uh, for them to come to the ER? These questions are assessing their ability to think and recall information. And if something is off internally, it's not going to be an easy thing to do. While your patient is speaking, you should also be noting if their speech is clear or if they are slurring their words. Like always, ask the when, the how, and the where questions. When did the symptoms start? How does the patient describe it? Where, the, where are the symptoms? What makes it better and what makes it worse? And then you're going to also ask about specific neural symptoms that can accompany whatever complaint they came in with. These can include headaches, dizziness, blurry vision, tingling and or numbness. We have tremors, balance or coordination issues, and even bladder and bowel function issues. 
you're also going to ask them if they have if this has ever happened before and if so what happened did it go away on its own or were they diagnosed with something right next which is very important for code stroke is when were they last seen normal when was the patient last seen normal as we know if the patient ends up getting TPA, we know that TPA is needs to be given within a specific window of 4.5 hours after the initial symptoms started. So you have to know when the patient was last seen normal for this. Then we're going to go into other things like if the patient is comatose, you can ask EMS or the family if it was sudden, if it was gradual or intermittent, right? For example, if it was sudden, it can be as a result of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. If it was gradual, perhaps it can be from a tumor inside their brain, or if it's fluctuating, perhaps from seizures or other pathologies, right? You're also going to want to ask about trauma. Let's say your patient comes in for a headache and they keep passing out, but were just recently, recently hit with a bat to the back of their head. Well, that's kind of important to know, right? Or they recently fell from a ladder and they're not acting normal per the family. That's also going to be important to know, right? And then you're also going to ask about prior medical problems, drug use, alcohol use, and smoking, and current medications. These are all important, right? For example, if the patient is on certain blood thinners, TPA may, not, may be contraindicated. So these are all important questions that you should be asking your neuro patients. Now, let's go over how I perform my assessment. For every neuro patient and perhaps every single patient, you're going to need a GCS score. I have a separate video on this, so I'm not going to talk about it here. So from top to bottom, I'll start with the pupils. Are they equal, round, and reactive to light? Is the reactivity to light brisk or sluggish? Are their pupils pinpoint or dilated? What about symmetry? Are they different shapes or sizes from each other? I'll have them follow my finger in a side to side motion, then up and down. I'm looking for nystagmus and whether the patient can actually do it. I'll have them close one eye, focus with the other on my nose and place fingers in each of the four quadrants, having them tell me how many fingers I'm holding up. I'll do this again with both eyes. Even though I already looked for a facial droop with my visual assessment, here I'm going to ask them to smile and to show their teeth, as this makes it easier to see a droop. I'll ask them to lift both of their eyebrows up as well. And then I'll look for symmetry as well. Then I'm going to test for their sensation on both sides of the face, asking if it feels the same, or is one side a little less, or is there tingling or numbness present. Then I'm going to move down to the arms, asking them to squeeze my fingers at the same time, noting if the strength is equal. I'll also have them push me away, then pull me towards them, again looking for their strength uh, to see if it's equal on both sides. And then to assess for a drift, I have them close their eyes, lift their arms up with the palms up, and I'll count to 10 out loud, noting for a drift while I'm counting out loud. Next, I'll do sensation just like I did with the face. Here, if needed, I would also do a finger-to-nose test to assess their coordination. Then, I would move down to the lower extremities, having them lift them up, push against my palm with pedal, uh, pedal flexion and extension. Then, I would also assess for a drift, having them lift each extremity separately and holding again for 10 seconds, counting out loud while I look for a drift at the same time. Here, I wanted to mention the NIH assessment, which essentially uh, tests for neurological deficits related to strokes. Every stroke patient will get a complete NIH, so you need to look into it. I'm not discussing it here because it would require its own in-depth video, but the link is here. But the link here is a free is a free resource that I have used. I think they are still doing the the free NIH certification, which is where I would originally get it. But my facility offers it now, so I just do it th through them. So check out the link or use whatever your facility is providing. But you need to know how to do a thorough NIH assessment and eventually get really good at it because every stroke patient is going to require one. Now let's talk about um doing an assessment on intubated neural patients right so the main thing with doing an assessment on intubated neural patients is that you're not going to get an accurate assessment if the sedation is still on board but are you going to stop the probe every hour to perform to perform an assessment right so that's why even if the patient is sedated it's still important to track trends again 
But in order to get an accurate assessment, especially for your baseline assessment, you should stop the probe. For my intubated patients, again, I'll assess their pupils, I'll get a GCS score, and then I'm going to assess each extremity separately for sensation and motor response. Yes, they may not be able to follow commands to the dot, but if, provide, but if you provide a noxious stimuli, they should be able to at least withdraw or be purposeful, signaling that sensation is present. And again, if they move that extremity, then movement is also present. But again, in order to fully get an accurate assessment, the sedation needs to be stopped. You're going to pause the probe to get a, a neuro assessment, especially at the beginning of your shift in order to get a good baseline assessment. You need to verify with your own facility what is acceptable as a noxious stimuli, whether nail bed pressure or a trapezius pinch are okay, or whatever your facility finds acceptable. Here, I just wanted to provide a quick checklist for yourself when you're doing a neural assessment. If you want to take a look at it longer, just go ahead and pause the video. But we have level of consciousness, orientation questions, pupils, speech, sensation, and then assessing the upper and lower extremities for their strength, looking for drifts, the grips for the upper extremities, and then doing pedal flexion and extension for the lower extremities. Now, let's get into some nursing specific tips. You must, you must get a good base on assessment for your patient because you won't know throughout your shift if something actually changed or if it was already there from the beginning unless you had a good bedside assessment. And then with this in mind, if you get a report from another nurse, do a bedside assessment with them, at least going over the deficits present so you are fully aware of what they are. And then, Anything can happen at any time, and even if the first few minutes after you take the report, a patient can stroke out again, and if you don't know what deficits they already had, you may not catch it, which is why it's important to get to do a neural assessment at the bedside with that off-going nurse. Remember that time is brain. And then the next tip is to learn again how to do an NIH assessment. Go to the website I provided. I'm going to put it in the description as well, or use whatever your facility has, but get really good with it. Finally, I think this is going to be the most important assessment for neuro patients, but for any patient with anything, don't be afraid to ask another nurse or provider for their opinion. If you feel that something is off but can't quite figure it out, don't hesitate to ask for assistance. Again, time is brain. The important thing is that you recognize that something was off. And I think this is very important for neuro patients because a lot of times it just, it's just so difficult to know when something is off. But if you just feel something is off or something's not the same as it was from your baseline assessment and you're not exactly sure what it is don't hesitate get another buddy nurse to come look at your patient one of the providers in the er said hey can you just check this out this is what i'm like uh thinking uh and then just get that second opinion right it's the best thing that you can do for yourself and for your patient now let's get into the question of the day what must be be placed on a patient during a conscious sedation to monitor their respiratory drive. So what do we place these patients on during a conscious sedation to monitor their respiratory drive? As always, the answer to this question will be at the bottom of the description text. If you enjoyed the content today, I would really like a, uh, I would really appreciate a like and a follow. And then there's some books that I put in the description that I personally enjoy and I always go back to. Um, I keep learning from them. I feel like I learn something new every time I open each book up and I have it in the description. And then also, if you fully, if you want to support further, I have some stickers and shirts up on Redbubble. And then as always, as always, teamwork makes the dream work. So help each other out. In the ER, you're not alone, so help each other out. Foster that teamwork environment in your own ER. So teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive. We stay ahead of it, we anticipate, and we don't just stand idle in the back, right? We are always doing something for our patients. Again, we are proactive, not reactive. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day.